produced Dr. Leanne Brady. She is a private practicing dentist and nationally recognized educator and writer. She has worked in a variety of practice models from small fee-for-service offices to large insurance dependent practices as an associate and as a practice owner. From 2005 to 2008, Dr. Brady held the position of resident faculty and clinical director for the Pinky Institute. In 2008, she moved to Scottsdale to join Frank Spear in the formation of Spear Education and the expansion of his curriculum. She served as Executive Vice President of Clinical Education until June 2011. As Director of Education and President of Leanne Brady LLC, she launched her website, leannebrady.com, offering clinical and practice content daily and innovative online and live educational programs. Dr. Brady? Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everybody, and thanks for being with us for Anterior Bike Plane Appliances. Um, this is a, uh, a topic that's actually near and dear to my heart. I am a general practitioner. I have a restorative practice, and appliance therapy in general um, presents a pretty good piece of what I do on a daily basis. Um, there was actually a period of time in my uh, career where I thought I might limit my practice to treating temporomandibular disorder patients and spend a lot of time um, taking some continuing education courses, doing the mini residency program at the University of Florida with Henry Grimion to learn about that. One of the things I decided for myself is that I love restorative dentistry and eliminating it um, wouldn't, wouldn't have been as fun as I thought. So I have maintained a restorative practice, but as part of that, um, incorporating appliance therapy has been important. And anterior bite plane appliances are one of my favorites, because I will tell you, of all of the different appliances that I make in my practice, this is the largest percentage. Um, and the reason being, it's such a versatile appliance. And so what we wanted to do this morning is really talk about all of the different uses for an anterior bite plane appliance, and then also talk about how are we going to understand who the patients are that we can apply these to. And so you'll see here on the slide, I have a list of some of the really common reasons that I'll use an anterior-only appliance. Um, you know, one of them as a restorative dentist is to verify centripetation, to know that I'm on the right arc of closure. And when I've made a decision that either diagnostically I need to have a set of records that are mounted on my articulator in centric relation, or that we're actually going to move forward and we're going to use centric relation as a reference position to treat this patient either orthodontically and we want to eliminate the slide or we're going to treat them restoratively and we want there to only be one stable reference position from which to design our occlusion. I want to have a way to know that I have done what I can to relax the muscles, to seat the condyles, and that this is a reproducible, verifiable position. And doing that with an anterior-only appliance is one of the most efficient and effective ways I can do that. You'll see next on my list is establishing joint comfort and stability. We're going to talk about many ways patients show up with joint signs and symptoms that an anterior bite appliance or anterior-only appliance can be the most appropriate thing. Muscle comfort and stability. You know, this is really where this style of appliance has gotten the most press and we hear about using them to treat headaches in our patients. And so we're going to talk about that as well. Occlusal stability. This is probably the most common reason appliances are made at all, is that we see signs or symptoms on the tops of the teeth. We believe the person has wear, that they're doing something parafunctionally, and we want to put something in protective to keep the teeth from being continued to be damaged. And an anterior-only appliance does that and does it well. And then I put on the list last, confirming my diagnosis. One of the biases that I have about appliance therapy is that we base the appliance, we're going to choose the appliance based on a clinical suspicion or a differential, because often there can be several different things that could be presenting with the same range of signs and symptoms. And although appliances are absolutely always designed to be therapeutic, they also confirm the diagnosis and because we want to see a specific result from doing the appliance. If we don't, we want to go back and we want to ask, us, ask ourselves the question, maybe my differential is wrong. If the appliance isn't producing the results we expect when we put a patient on an appliance, we need to ask those questions, not simply continue to adjust the appliance. And so I always use it as a confirmation tool for my diagnosis. So as we move forward and we talk about anterior-only appliances, and you'll see here, we're going to show a variety of these appliances in the, in the pictures. 
Um, and, and in this particular slide, this actually is a best bite excluder from WIPMIX. Um, and you'll see here for me, I've got it relined. This is one of the ways that I do this. Um, and it's just been relined with byte registration paste, and then that's been relined with light body VPS material so that we get a very snug and accurate fit to the appliance over the patient's maxillary anterior teeth. So what do anterior-only appliances accomplish for us? Well, all appliances work because we understand how the relationship of the tooth contacts, which teeth are touching in which positions, intercuspal position, excursive positions, the steepness of the guidance when the patient moves into excursive positions, those tooth contacts and the way the teeth contact have an impact both on all of the musculature, so the elevator muscles and the positional muscles. It also has an impact on the amount of load or force that's being delivered through the joint. And then, of course, it actually alters the tooth contacts, which alters which teeth are being impacted by the force in which position. So if we think about those basic concepts, altering muscle force, altering joint loading, altering tooth contacts, it tells us how every appliance works. Then it's a simple matter of taking the patient's presenting condition, what we know about altering tooth contacts to change muscle force and joint loading, to design the appropriate appliance to get the result for that individual patient. So anterior-only appliances, what do they do? What are the physics behind them? Well, what we know about tooth contacts and muscle force is that when back teeth touch, more of the elevator muscles are engaged. Therefore, more force is applied across the system. So the more of the posterior teeth we eliminate, the less force is applied across the system, the less elevator muscle activity we have. Those tooth contacts and bracing against the elevator muscles also cause the positional muscles to fire and to be working. So those are our lateral pterygoid muscles, our positional muscles. So when we think about an anterior-only appliance, what we know is the fewer teeth that are touching in the posterior, the less muscle force. So anterior-only appliances specifically are made. Their primary reason they're made is to limit the number of tooth contacts, move those contacts as far to the anterior as possible to eliminate the muscle force. Different styles of anterior-only appliances can have contact with just central incisors or all the way through the canine on either side. And there are some varying reasons to do those, but in general, even in the anterior, the fewer teeth that are touching, the less muscle force. So when we have only central incisors touching, we're going to have less muscle across, force across the system than when we have canines touching. And so for some patients, there may be reasons to do that and only have centrals. Other times, if someone can really still continue to clench or work their muscles pretty hard on the anterior only, we might want to extend those contacts so that no teeth are being overly impacted. So decreased elevator muscle activity and therefore concomitant release of the lateral pterygoids is the primary reason we make an anterior-only appliance. When those elevator muscles release and aren't active and therefore the lateral pterygoid releases, then naturally the condyle seat into centric relation because centric relation is a physiologic position and the only thing that can keep the condyles from seating in that anterior medial superior position is firing of the lateral pterygoid muscles, positioning the mandible in a way that brings all the teeth together into intercuspal position. So there's lots and lots of anterior only or anterior bite plane style appliances. Um, you know, I don't remember how many years ago it was now, but I think it was probably 2005, maybe 2004, um, JADA, the Journal of the American Dental Association, did an article on commonly used appliances in the United States. And they actually listed 25 named appliances. Um, and when I read the article, I actually thought they had missed a few that were pretty popular. And since then, we've had lots and lots of other appliances come on the market. In general, when I think about appliances, I divide them up and think about the design or the physics behind the appliance. And what you come to realize is of those 25, 30, maybe 40 different named appliances in the United States, there's really only about five or six basic designs based on physics. So when we think about anterior-only appliances, there's lots and lots of them that people will use different names. Um, the common ones that I've got here are the Holly appliance. Um, you know, that was actually sort of the beginning, the iteration of this style of an appliance was what we think of as a Holly retainer, but with a bite plane 
on the lingual, the upper central incisors to disclude the posterior teeth. And commonly then today we have lots of these that we can either make in our offices or we can purchase to reline. Um, in my office I have two styles of anterior only appliance that I'll use as an appliance. I will make someone a Lucia jig. So one of the things we want to clarify is that Lucia jigs are basically anterior only appliances. They're just not used as an appliance. They're used as a diagnostic tool in the office to try to get some of our records. But as a take-home appliance, I use two. I use the Best Bite Discorder, which you see pictured here from Withmix, and then I will make custom-made anterior-only appliances. And I have varying reasons that we'll go through on why I use those. I know in a, in a follow-up webinar to this that Withmix is doing with Dr. Mike Milkers, who's a good friend, coming up I think in the next month or two, um, he's going to really look at the construction of these types of appliances and utilizing the different styles and what they're good for. So I'd suggest that um, you put those dates on your calendar as soon as you get them from Whitmix. So as we think about using this, I want to just start with the foundation, which is really how I think about everything in my practice. Um, being successful at any procedure in my office, whether that's a simple posterior composite, a full mouth reconstruction, or appliance therapy, always begins with having the appropriate information from the exam. So I need to understand the person's presenting condition, therefore move to a diagnosis, and then that diagnosis or maybe stable of potential diagnoses, my differential, is going to lead me to my treatment options. So let's think about that as we think about appliance therapy. So there's three pieces of information that I need to be able to understand the appropriate appliance for the patient and also to understand how I expect that appliance to work, therefore I can monitor the results and the outcome. And we're going to look at all three of those, not in depth, we're not going to go through the entire evaluation, but I want to hit the points of that evaluation that for me are relevant to choosing an anterior only appliance. So we're going to look at joints, muscles, and dentition, the three pieces we always look at when we think about appliance therapy. So let's get started with our joint exam. So one of the things that is a key piece for me in a joint exam is what we call a lateral pole palpation. And when we are palpating the lateral pole, we're actually isolating the lateral pole of the condyle on the external portion of the patient's face. I actually put my fingers just in front of their external auditory meatus, have the patient open and close two or three times until I can get the lateral pole of the condyle just under one finger, under my index finger. And then the lateral pole palpation, I'm just going to press in and release, classically with one to two pounds of pressure, no more. Um, if you palpate with too much pressure, you can get a false positive. So when we do this particular palpation, so we're actually palpating from the tip of our finger over the lateral pole, we're compressing two different soft tissue elements. So we're actually compressing the capsule around the temporal mandibular joint, and we're actually putting pressure on the synovial membrane, the tissues that produce the synovial fluid. Normal would be for the patient to say, yes, I feel pressure, but there's absolutely no even mild tenderness all the way up to discomfort. If the patient reports at one to two pounds of pressure that there's anything even mild tenderness all the way up to discomfort, what we know is there's an inflammatory process going on either in the tissues of that capsule or in the synovial membrane. And so we're going to have a differential of either capsulitis or synovitis. That's what detects that inflammatory response. The next palpation when I look at joint palpation is what we call retrodiscal palpation. That's the highly innervated, highly vascular tissue behind the head of the condyle. It's the tissue in the temporal mandibular joint that's responsible for bringing all of the nutrients, the oxygen, everything that the joint needs so the tissues stay healthy into the joint and then taking out all of the byproducts of metabolism and getting rid of all of the trash, shall we say, that's generated as the cells work in the temporal mandibular joint. Those tissues compress when we actually close and seat the condyle, and then they expand to fill the space behind the head of the condyle when we open. And it is that opening and closing movement that actually brings fluids in and out of the joint. How do we do a retrodiscal palpation? There's actually several ways. My favorite is extra orally. So I'll have the patient open as wide as possible. And now my finger, which was positioned for lateral pole, will fall into a depression behind the head of the condyle. Now I can simply turn my finger sort of anteriorly and in. 
and palpate against the posterior lateral aspect of the head of the condyle. And as we said, when we do this palpation, and you can see the positioning of my finger here in this image, um, what we're compressing is the retrodiscal tissue. As I said, that's highly innervated and highly vascular tissue. And so we want to do this palpation and really stay with just about one pound of pressure. By the way, for me, the way I understand how much pressure is, and you can practice your index finger against your thumb, um, if I can simply get the bed of my fingernail to blanch, I'm at about one pound of pressure. If I get a positive response with retrodiscal tissues, then I know there's inflammation in those tissues. I'm curious as to why. And my differential diagnosis at this point would be retrodiscitis. So when we think about that and we think about um, how is making an anterior-only appliance going to help us in treating lateral pole palpation tenderness or retrodiscal tissue palpation tenderness? Well, we basically want to take some load or some force off of those tissues. We want to be able to give those tissues a chance to heal. We may have a belief that there's something about the patient's occlusion that is overloading those tissues, either um, something they're doing parafunctionally, clenching or grinding, a position that they can get their mandible in. It may be just the normal function of their occlusion if they have an envelope of function violation. So what we want to do is two things. We want to alter the occlusion to see if that helps the joint fold better. But the other thing to know about an anterior-only appliance is we said the main thing it does is it decreases elevator muscle engagement. When we significantly decrease elevator muscle engagement, we decrease the force across the entire system. We can have a corollary decrease in joint loading. I do want to talk about this for just a second, and this can be a sort of a complex concept um, that we could talk for hours just about joint loading. But in general, when we think about load across the joint, we've probably all seen the graphic that shows that if we have tooth contact all the way back to the second molars, we actually only get about you know, less than 15%, some people say 5% of the total force across the system being delivered up through the condyle disc assembly. If we have anterior only tooth contact, those numbers go up and we have about 65% of the total force being delivered through the condyle disc assembly. But here's the part of this to remember. If we have anterior only tooth contact, we can actually be decreasing the total force down to a mere a tiny percentage, as little as 10% of the total that was there when the second molars were touching. So 65% of that much, much smaller number could be a total joint load that's less than when we have the second, the second molars touching. So yes, from a percentage perspective, we need to understand the difference between when we have anterior tooth contact and posterior tooth contact in joint loading. The reason an anterior-only appliance works to decrease total joint load is because it can significantly decrease the muscle engagement. So that's the game we're playing. It's kind of like we think about muscles and joints being on either end of a teeter-totter. So we make somebody an anterior-only appliance such that we then are decreasing that joint load and we're allowing those retrodiscal tissues and the lateral pole, the capsule, the synovial membrane tissues to heal and to, and to relax from those, uh, this condition they were in. And then we would redo our exam to see if we actually made that improvement. So then we would move on to muscles. And when we think about muscle tenderness and muscle tightness, our patients present with lots of signs that things are going on with their elevator muscles and their positional muscles. It could be something all the way from they actually have discomfort. One of the common reasons that we use anterior-only appliances will be when we have patients who come in with headache. Let's be very specific about the types of headaches. Um, there are as many diagnoses for headaches as there are patients in my practice. And do I have a lot of patients who actually do have what we call migraines or cluster headaches? They've been to a neurologist? Absolutely. I also have quite a lot of patients in my practice that have what I would diagnose as muscle tension headaches. I also have concomitant patients, so patients who have a diagnosis of having migraines or cluster headaches, but also have muscle tension. And what I know is 
when the elevator muscles are tense, when they have temporalis tenderness and tension, that can actually be a trigger for their migraine or their cluster headaches. So one of the things that we want to do as a differential is see if we can relax those muscles. We can actually have a positive impact on their headaches. Then we have the patients who come in and literally simply tell us that they have muscle tenderness, that they actually wake up and their face hurts, or that um, they, their jaws get tired when they eat. One of the classic questions that I ask my patients in a history is, can you chew gum? Um, and patients always chuckle because they think the right answer is that they shouldn't chew gum. Um, and I always left them saying, so, you know, what I want to know is if, if you had a piece of gum, could you actually chew it? And that's a great question because, you know, all of our patients should be able to do that without experiencing fatigue, without their muscles getting so tired that they have to stop. Same thing with having a nice steak or, you know, any food of any kind of thickness or, um, you know, stiffness. So those are common questions that I'll get in a history. You know, patients who will come in and say, when I wake up in the morning, you know, my face just real, feel, feels really stiff and tight and I have to kind of exercise it and open it up. Those are all great indicators that the person has elevator muscles that are working beyond their adaptive capacity. And it can be a great place to apply an anterior-only appliance to see if we can make some improvements. So we're going to actually do a muscle palpation. And I actually go through all of those palpations. So I will do um, masseter muscles, anterior temporalis, posterior temporalis, sternocleidomastoid, digastrics, um, and, and medial pterygoids, looking for signs of muscles that are being used beyond their adaptive capacity, so positive palpation responses. I also do range of motion. And so when we think about a range of motion test, normal openings between 35 and 60 millimeters, that 35 is actually comes from the medical community, because if you cannot open 35 millimeters, in a medical emergency, you couldn't be intubated. Um, 35 millimeter opening is not enough for us to do any dentistry on the second molars, nor for the patient to eat a nice big hamburger or sub sandwich. Um, so I usually try to see patients more with openings in the 50 to 60 millimeter range. Lateral range of motion, normal is 6 to 15 millimeters. I look for evenness or symmetry from right to left. So if someone can only go 7 millimeters to the right but 15 to the left, I wonder what's going on with the muscles that's limiting that one direction. So I am going to look at the actual measurements for range of motion. I'm going to look at the ease with which the patient can make those movements. You know, if their muscles are twitching and they're having trouble doing it, I wonder if there's something we can do that will help them so that they can actually get that full range of motion. Bilateral guidance manipulation, people use lots of names for it. I know lots and lots of us kind of cringe when we think of the idea of putting our hands on someone's mandible and trying to guide their mandible. Um, and I would tell you, for me, I have lots of tools in my toolbox to help me find centric relation, one of which is an anterior-only appliance. Um, but I do often go ahead and use this technique just because I want to actually, I'm not going to move the patient's mandible. I'm going to have them move it, but I want my fingers there so that proprioceptively I can evaluate what does it feel like when they arc their mandible. Does it feel easy and smooth, or does it feel like they're really having to think about it or they're having to fight their muscles to do that? It just gives me some feedback about what those muscles are doing. So if I go and I do my muscle palpation, I do my range of motion, um, the patient actually comes in and says, I wake up and I have muscle pain or muscle tightness. You know, in my list of differentials, I have myositis, which is just inflammation of the muscles. Myofacial pain is the differential I use when the patient actually reports symptoms. And if I believe that there's a connection between the tops of the teeth, their existing occlusion, their parafunctional positions, what they do with their teeth, and what's going on with the muscles, then my differential will include occlusal muscle disorder as a possible diagnosis. So I'm going to put all of those pieces together with some other tests that now are a crossover. So when we think about load testing, load testing is actually a way to get information both about the positional muscles, so the lateral pterygoid, which really is not a muscle we can palpate. So we have to think about other ways to find out how this muscle is doing, but also gives us information about the joint and what's going on in the joint. So when we do a load test, there's actually a number of ways to do a load test. Many of you may have learned how to do a load test by actually having your hands on the patient's mandible. And so after you'd arc them to try to find first point of contact um, with 
the bilateral manipulation, then you might also load. You'd increase the firmness and the amount of pressure on your fingers on the angle of the mandible and load the joint. Um, you can also do a load test using a device called the leaf gauge that basically creates that load in the joint area. Um, and simply making someone an anterior only appliance and allowing them to sit on that appliance for 10 or 15 minutes can be used as a preliminary load test. What are we testing when we do a load test? Well, we're actually testing two things. We're testing the lateral pterygoid. So a lateral pterygoid muscle that's been contracted in a forward position that's spasmed um, is going to resist seating the condyle into centric relation. We also are testing those retrodiscal tissues. So if we have a situation where the disc is displaced and the patient actually seats their condyle, they're pinching retrodiscal tissues, we would have a positive load test. So as I said, this is a crossover. It gives us information about both the joint and the muscles. And what we want to do is we want to be able to figure out if there's a positive load test, which is it? Is it a lateral pterygoid that's giving us those results? Or is it coming from the disc? So if someone has a positive load test, then you have several things in your differential. One is a disc displacement. So if you have a, either a lateral pole disc displacement or a medial pole disc displacement, you can have some positiveness on a load test. You could have, again, retrodiscitis. They're pinching that retrodiscal tissue. Or it could be muscle tightness from specifically the lateral pterygoid. We want to be able to differentiate between those three things. For me, this is where an anterior-only appliance becomes a great diagnostic tool. So someone who has lateral pterygoid spasm or lateral pterygoid tightness on an anterior-only appliance, over time that muscle will release because it's going to respond to the release of the elevator muscles and you'll now be able to very comfortably seat that condyle. Where if the person has a true disc displacement and they actually are pinching retrodiscal tissue on an anterior-only appliance, they would become increasingly uncomfortable. So making that differential can be helped by using an anterior-only appliance. So when I think about that, one of the things that I will think about is again going back to how is the appliance working? What's it actually doing? Because understanding that science is going to help me know, did it do what I wanted it to do? And so when we decrease the muscle engagement, we get the back teeth out of contact, they're not sending a message through the PDL to the brain to have those elevator muscles fire and the lateral pterygoid muscle fire over time. It doesn't happen instantly, by the way. Um, there are some techniques, and I'll use them in my office, where I'll use a Best Bite, and I'll make someone a Best Bite discluder, and I'll have them just wear it in my office for 10, 15, maybe even 30 minutes if I can have them just have a sit in the operatory or even go sit back out in the waiting room and come back in. Is it possible to get release of the elevator muscles and release of the lateral pterygoid muscle in a quick period of time, 10, 15 minutes, 30 minutes? It is for some patients. And for other patients, this is a process that can take days, even up to several weeks, depending upon the chronicity of what they presented with, the amount of contraction and spasm of those muscles. There's lots of things that go into that. But over time, if it is truly muscle, Having the back teeth out of contact will decrease the muscle engagement, therefore release the lateral pterygoids, and then seat the condyles. If we're significantly decreasing that muscle engagement, we'll also be decreasing joint loading. So this is an appliance that, as I said, is so versatile because it can work in all of those ways. And so what do we want to look for as we make an anterior-only appliance? Again, for me, one of the things that I would tell you is really know where the disc is. So part of the exam that we're not going to go through um, at great length today and talk about is the part of the exam where you figure out using the history and the existing joint sounds where the disc is. So if a patient has joint sounds on rotation, so when they are opening just that first quarter inch of opening, or if you're listening, let's say, to the right joint, and you actually have the person do a right working movement. So they're actually moving their mandible to the side you're listening. You're listening to rotation. Joint load during rotation is through the medial aspect of the condyle disc assembly. So if you hear either crepitus or popping and clicking in rotation, your suspicion is that the patient is off the medial aspects of the disc, so they have a medial 
pole disc displacement, that is a patient I would not use an anterior-only appliance on. They're basically in a seated condylar position, an intercuspal position. They're loading retrodiscal tissue and or hopefully a pseudo-disc. Um, but that's not a patient you want to put in, in an anterior-only. However, if they're quiet on rotation and the sounds that you hear are on lateral aspects, so they have pops or clicks, this is, a, this is a safe patient to use an anterior-only appliance on so that we can get the great benefits of muscle release and decreasing the joint loading to help get rid of their signs and symptoms. And so when we think about that also, one of the things I want to think about is a common place as a restorative dentist that I use an anterior-only appliance is for my patients that either have difficulty opening very wide and we need to do some restorative dentistry, or we have lots and lots of patients who their muscles fatigue so easily that they can't get through a hygiene appointment. They can't get through a simple appointment where we're going to do some composites. Well, making them a best bite discluder, sending them home with it, and asking them to sleep with it, even just the night before the appointment, wear it into the office. So when they come into the office, the muscles are really nice and relaxed before you go to do that hygiene visit, before you go to do that composite. Um, will allow them to be much more comfortable during the appointment. Also, it will allow you to get your work done most efficiently. They'll be able to stay open. And then if during the appointment they get a little fatigued and you need to take a little break, have them just pop their best bite back in and wear it for five or ten minutes while you're waiting for anesthesia or you know, if you're making a provisional while you're out of the mouth trimming the provisional. Really will help keep them comfortable. So if you can think about what they do, the effect of the appliance, you'll find all sorts of ways to use this style of an appliance in your practice. So let's talk about the teeth now as well. So we've talked about using an anterior only appliance to protect the teeth. And this again is the common reason that we make appliances, is we see signs or symptoms on the dentition and we want to protect the teeth for our patients. And so this for me is kind of my short list of the signs and or symptoms that I see when a patient presents with what I call occlusal disease. And I am really specific about using the terminology occlusal disease. Um, and I do that for two reasons. I do it, number one, because it sends a certain message um, for me and for my team members that this is serious. It is a disease. It's something that could cause the person to lose their teeth just as quickly as periodontal disease could um, or having caries could. It also then sends that same message to the patients that it's not like, yeah, people have wear and wear is normal and this just is part of the aging process. That they actually have something happening to their teeth that is above and beyond what we would see that we would consider age appropriate. It's progressing at a rate that we're concerned about the longevity of their teeth. So I think about those things and I go through my list of things like wear, cracks, fractures, fremitus. You all can read the list and we can sort of talk about some of those things. Um, wear for me is one of the ones that people struggle with a lot. And we do need to, to be able to differentiate when we see tooth wear or a loss of tooth structure. Is it coming from attrition? the act of rubbing the teeth against one another, or is it an erosive process or an abrasive process? Um, and the challenge of that sometimes is that when people do have acid present in their mouth, they have an erosive process going on, the teeth will also be subject to attrition, and any minor rubbing of the teeth together will produce signs that look much worse than the actual activity. But we do need to get really good. We need to hone our diagnostic skills at figuring that out. And then for me, one of the things I want to do is I want to be able to intervene, whether that's simply at the level of having a conversation with my patients, all the way up to actually treating that um, to protect the teeth and prevent continued attrition or erosion of their teeth, loss of tooth structure. For me, I simply ask myself, is the loss of tooth structure, the amount of tooth structure that's missing, age appropriate because a certain amount of wear does occur over a lifespan. Um, but when I see a 16-year-old patient, as we saw in the previous slide, that has the tooth loss of someone who's in their 40s or 50s, that's not age appropriate. That actually falls in that category of occlusal disease. It's progressing at a rate 
that by the time she is 50, if we do nothing, she might need a major reconstruction. She might not even be able to save some of those lower anterior teeth. So that's what I look at for wear. Cracks and fractures. Um, there are a lot of things that cause cracked teeth and fractured teeth. And um, we also need to be able to put the pieces together. I consider it sort of multifactorial. And so yes, does having a large restoration in a tooth make it susceptible to cracking or fracturing? Of course it does, just like the fact that the caries that was in that tooth weakened the tooth. And then we went in with a handpiece and we worked on the tooth and that potentially weakened the tooth. But all of us know we see teeth that have 40 and 50 year old amalgams and composites and the patient has no cracks or fractures anywhere in their mouth. And then we also see absolutely virgin um, upper first bicuspids and lower first molars that fracture from the mesial to the distal. Well, we can't blame it on an old amalgam, an old composite, you know, the caries, that it is coming from force. So we need to put those pieces together. Fremitus is the vibration in the teeth when the person taps their teeth together or goes into their excursive positions. Fremitus is actually our body's way of trying to adapt to excessive force. So we actually get an expansion of the periodontal ligament. The tooth becomes a little looser and is able to move out of the way versus fracturing or cracking. So we want to look at that um, all the way up to frank mobility. And you know, we don't have the the time to talk about the relationship between occlusal disease and periodontal disease today. Um, but they, you know, bugs do cause periodontal disease, um, but occlusal trauma can be a contributing factor. Non-carious cervical lesions for me, again, multifactorial, um, and I want to be able to find the ones where the tooth is under an excessive amount of force, so I can make choices about changing that. Um, tooth sensitivity is also a place where people can get a chronic pulpitis in a tooth that shows up as cold sensitivity because it's under occlusal trauma. Very common sometimes in the premolar teeth, the first point of contact, second molars. And look at where you see all of these factors overlapping each other. So a tooth that has a wear facet also has some cracks and fracture lines, has a non-carious cervical lesion, and is also sensitive start thinking about where they show up together and how that might be related to function, to occlusion. Part of my occlusal exam is a functional analysis. I want to know which teeth touch in which positions. Um, classically, I use red articulating marks for the excursive positions. I use green for intercuspal position and having the patient tap and tap twice. And again, when I look at these marks, you know, there are lots and lots of patients in my practice that have what I would call a malocclusion, but that do not suffer from occlusal disease. So they have no wear, no cracks, no fractures, no sensitivity, no non-carious cervical lesions, fremitus mobility. Why? Because they don't do anything with their teeth except eat. Therefore, those tooth contacts aren't creating maladaptive processes. On the other side of it, I have patients who have perfect class one occlusions where we still struggle with the signs of occlusal disease because of the things they do with the teeth, the time that they have their teeth together, and the force that they can apply and how they apply it. So I have to look at these things together. Can I improve the tooth contacts, the occlusion, but also what does the person do with their teeth? One of the things that an anterior-only appliance, that appliances in general are designed to do, is to test the theory that the tops of the teeth and what the patient does with the tops of their teeth is causing the signs and symptoms we see at a joint level, at a muscle level, and a dentition level. We do that by altering the tooth contacts artificially because now they only occlude on the top of the appliance and then going back and retesting the joints, the muscles, and looking at the alteration in the teeth. So if someone has muscle tenderness, and we believe it's coming from their existing occlusion or their parafunctional activity, we put them in an anterior-only bite appliance, we change that occlusion, we change what they can do with their muscles, we go back and repeat the muscle exam and the tenderness is gone, we now have evidence that altering their occlusal scheme will have a positive impact, that those two things are related together. When we see all of those things together, the wear, the fractures, my differential is occlusal disease, so that is actually what I write in my chart. So that therefore now I have something that I can actively be treating, again, by using my appliance. So we're going to put those pieces into kind of a whole list of things. We've talked a bunch about seated condylar position um, and about you know, centric relation. 
And again, for me, there's a lot of reasons for this. I want to know where centric relation is most often as a diagnostic physician. So I want to have an understanding of what's the difference in the mandibular relationship to the maxilla when their condyles are seated to when they actually have their teeth together in intercuspal position. Now that difference is present depending on the studies you look at in anywhere from 85 to 90 something percent of the population. For most patients, the difference is tiny, it's less than a millimeter, and really may not have great impact when we actually start to do orthodontics or restorative dentistry or have a role in their signs and symptoms if they do have TMD signs and symptoms. But for another percentage of the population, that shift can be huge, can be you know, three, four, eight, ten millimeters, and can have a huge impact in what we do, whether that's ortho or restorative dentistry, and can be playing a significant role in what the patient is doing with their muscles and the signs and symptoms they're experiencing. So I always want to know where it is and what that difference is. Then I can make choices about how we're going to factor centric relation or seated condylar position into our treatment plan as we move forward. And so when we think again about now using this anterior biplane, um, you know, how does it help me locate seated columnar position? Because it's going to relax the elevator muscles, it's going to relax and release the lateral pterygoid, which is the only muscle that can hold the condyle in a different position from seated condylar position. Therefore, the condyles will see, and now it makes it very easy for me to get those records. I can get centric relation bite records. One of the things that is great to use a best bite for is actually as a way to, to get those records. So you can use it to record those records by relighting the best bite, having the patient wear it when they sleep for a few weeks, bring them in, and then with the best bite in, you literally just have them go forward, back, lightly squeeze, mark that position, have them tap on some articulating paper, and then that's the position you want to have them bite into when you do the bite records, and just use bite silicone on their posterior teeth in order to record that position. So when we bring all of this together, so what are the patients, what are the presenting conditions, the indications for using an anterior-only appliance? And you'll see here in this photograph, this is actually an anterior bite plane. Um, it's another design of an anterior-only appliance I use commonly in my practice. And this one I actually custom make for the patient. So any muscle condition. So if the patient presents with muscle signs or symptoms, all the way from headache that you believe is either being caused by muscle tension or that muscle tension is a contributing factor to their headaches and you want to be able to have a positive impact to them. Um, tightness when they open and close their mouth, when they wake or when they chew. Muscle fatiguing so they can't chew and eat all the things that they want to eat. Limited range of motion so you believe their muscle tightness is preventing them from opening or moving their mandible maximally. Um, the inability to find seated condylar positions so they have muscles that are holding them in a forward position and preventing us from getting the records that we need. Even all the way to improving um, patient comfort during dental procedures. So patients who have muscle tightness um, that only impacts their lifestyle when they come in for a hygiene appointment or a long dental appointment. We want to have a device that can really help optimize their comfort in the office. All of those are indications for an anterior-only appliance. Um, immediate protection of porcelain. We haven't talked about this um, so far to date in this webinar, but one of the things that many, many of us like to do is when we do restorative dentistry for patients, we'd like to give them a way to protect that, to have an insurance policy. An anterior-only appliance is a great way not only to alter the occlusal context such that um, they're not on the porcelain at night when they're sleeping, but also, again, decrease the muscle activity. The more we decrease the force, the less damage the patient can do to the muscles, joints, or the dentition, and in this case, to their brand new porcelain veneers. Clenchers are really, for me, one of the places where you know, I'm so glad I have anterior-only appliance designs. Um, patients who clench, that's their parafunctional activity. Um, and have healthy joints so we can have them on an anterior only and we're not worried about the joint loading. A lot of these patients who have a clenching habit, um, number one, even on a very, very exquisitely adjusted full coverage appliance, because they still have posterior tooth contact, 
they can still clench, and they can clench with full force, so they still experience those muscle signs and symptoms. And what the appliance is simply doing is just protecting the teeth so that they're not actually clenching into the cusps and fossa and can crack teeth. But it's not helping with the muscles. Where we put them on an anterior only and we get posterior teeth out of the way, we will decrease their muscle force. Now, some of the patients who clench, you'll decrease muscle force um, by getting them off their back teeth, but they can still apply a significant amount of force. So that's why we want to make sure they have healthy joints, the disc is in the right place, so that they're not overly loading that condyle disc assembly. Um, but great, great tool for patients who clench. Um, one of the things that I'll do with some of my more complex TMD patients where we have had long-standing chronic pain related to muscles um, and we're really challenged in helping them get 100% better, is I'll actually make them two appliances. I'll make them a full coverage appliance design and an anterior only appliance design, and I'll actually have them figure out a schedule of varying those two appliances. So they sleep in one for a week and then they sleep in the other for a week. And the going back and forth actually will help decrease their muscle symptoms and help them stay comfortable. A lot of reasons behind that. Each one has a different vertical dimension. They have different tooth contacts. Um, but that can be a really great way to help in some of these um, patients where they almost feel like they have intractable muscle pain that we can't get rid of. And that shows up a lot with patients who clench. Contraindications. So where would I say um, making an anterior only is not the best appliance design? Patients who have joint pain on loading, and notice I put joint pain. So we are clear their discomfort is coming from pinching tissues in the actual temporal mandibular joint, not a lateral pterygoid spasm, um, patients who have a disc displacement, and it is uncomfortable for them when they actually load the joint, either in a cuspal position or when they go to excursions. Um, this is not a patient we want to put on an anterior only. They need second molar tooth contact, so they need an appliance design that will support that. Um, and I put here any patient whose symptoms get worse. That's not just true of anterior only appliances. That's actually true of all appliances. One of the things that I, that I myself have experienced and I find a lot with dentists is we make an appliance um, and then we really, really get invested in its working. And if the patient comes back and they have more symptoms or different symptoms or they're not getting better, we start to adjust the appliance. It must be something about the occlusal contacts. Um, and we keep adjusting and keep adjusting. We really want to look at that and say, I need to go all the way back to my exam. Was my differential right? Or maybe did I miss something and I need to think about a different appliance design? And the possibility that it may not be occlusally related at all. There are patients who can present with signs or symptoms that look just like temporomandibular disorders that are coming from something totally neurological, something outside the scope of what we can impact by altering occlusal contacts. So that's a place we really want to be cautious. Um, and so any patient whose symptoms are getting worse, I want to rethink that. You know, one of the classic ones in that for me is patients with lateral pterygoid spasm. So patients who have a significant AP component um, between seated condylar position and intercuspal position, and we put them on an anterior only, which is going to sort of rapidly try to seat their condyle, and they may come in with some pretty dis distinct discomfort, and they point right over the joint and they say, this is where it hurts. Even if I'm really, really confident that their joints are healthy and that this is coming from a lateral pterygoid, I will transition them off into a different type of an appliance so that I can try to walk them back slowly to a seated condylar position. Um, and then at that point, they'd be wholly appropriate for an anterior bite plane appliance um, because we've now got that lateral pterygoid released. But we really want to, do want to be responsive to that so that we find ourselves doing things for folks that um, not only are helping, but are helping in a pretty gentle, comfortable way for them. I do want to just talk for, about risks for a second. I just want to show you, this is, a, this is actually a photograph from my friend Mike Melkers, practices in Spokane, Washington, who, as I said, is doing the follow-up webinar to this one, um, I think maybe in another month or two, who also uses Best Buy. He actually has his relined with a different kind of a silicone material. It's a clear silicone material. So you can actually reline these and custom fit them a lot of ways. 
um, really common to use silicone bite registration paste or any kind of silicone impression material. Also very common, you can reline these with forms of acrylic, so methyl methacrylate acrylic, um, and there's a technique for doing that. Um, but they're very versatile from that perspective and easy to adjust. But what are the risks? What are some of the things that you're going to see when using anterior-only appliances other than that some patients may experience a little bit of discomfort? And then we have to figure out, is that a person who has a joint condition and we want to get them like on a full coverage appliance? Or is it a patient where it's just lateral pterygoid spasm and we need to walk them back? By the way, when you think about that, um, the percentage of patients who walk in your practice who actually are going to have a joint condition that um, is going to prevent them from using an anterior only is actually very small. We have lots and lots of patients who pop and click. Um, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but in my practice, I guess it's probably 40 to 50 percent of my patient population. Um, and of those patients, 97 percent of it are patients with a lateral pole disc displacement, medial poles in place, so we can very comfortably load their joints. Um, they're, they're great patients for an anterior only. So it's a very small percentage, but you do want to know where's the disc. Other than that, anterior migration or posterior extrusion with excessive use. So one of the things you'll hear about with anterior only appliances is, is that people's occlusion is altered. And there can be two reasons for that. We're going to talk about both of them. Um, can, they, can people get tooth movement? They can. Um, we're not really 100% sure if the posterior teeth extrude or the anterior teeth intrude because of the force applied to them. Um, but we can see people who have had tooth movement. I will tell you, um, at knock on wood, in my practice, I've not had this happen, but I have seen photographs of patients from other people's practices where it's happened. If we go to the science, if we go to the research, the research really supports that tooth movement is going to occur, number one, in a very, very small percentage of our patient population. And it only occurs when they're wearing the appliance and they don't have the rest of their tooth contact more than 10 to 12 hours a day. I tell my patients when I deliver an anterior-only appliance, um, my instructions are there to sleep in the appliance. Um, their sleeping hours are typically six to eight hours a night. Maybe you'll run into a patient who sleeps 10 hours, but um, especially in the US here, that's pretty uncommon. Um, but they are not to wear the appliance during the daytime that they would take the appliance out, put their teeth back together, and then go through the day without it. Um, there are designs of an anterior-only appliance. If you have a patient that needs to wear it um, when they're awake during the day, you can make them a different style of anterior-only appliance that prevents at least posterior tooth extrusion. Um, but that's something you just need to moderate for patients. Most of my patients who wear this kind of an appliance um, use it sort of PRN, like the patient who comes in, just wears it the night before an appointment. Um, if we're seating condyles, they're going to sleep in it for two weeks and come back in and take records. Um, for most muscle symptoms, it's going to be a sleep in the appliance for just a few weeks and they feel better. And then they can periodically put the appliance back in if they feel symptoms coming back. So again, it's PRN. Um, but you need to talk with your patients about that and give them good instructions. Um, the next one is mandibular repositioning. Again, really rare occurrence. I think in 10 years of making appliances routinely, hundreds of them a year, um, I've seen this happen twice in my practice. I've actually talked to a couple of good friends who do a lot of TMD therapy, and none of us can, can get over three patients we've ever seen this happen on. When does it happen? It happens on the patients who have a really large anterior posterior discrepancy from seated condylar position to intercuspal position. It's one of the reasons we want to know if that slide is more than three millimeters in an AP position. So these are really sort of our patients that are skeletally class two but have a great Sunday bite. They hold their mandible out in a class one position um, for intercuspal position. And they, you know, a very small percentage of our patients, their muscles get so deprogrammed that they lose the ability to refine intercuspal position. Um, so we're going to know the risk because they have a large slide. I talk to my patients about this because it never happens overnight. It happens gradually. So I instruct my patients, take your anterior only appliance out first thing in the morning. Pay attention to where your teeth touch. Typically by the time you're done brushing your teeth and eating breakfast, when you bite your teeth together again, it should feel like your normal bite. If it starts to take longer in the morning before you can find your bite, please take your appliance out and discontinue wearing it until you can come back in and see me and we can have a conversation about it. 
Now, for some of these patients, that's exactly what would need to have happen, but we need to understand what's going on, and we need to not be surprised, and they need to not be surprised. If you do have someone where this happens, one of the things you can try um, is to reprogram the muscles by having them come out on their incisal edges end to end, and then slide back into intercuspal position. And repeating this you know, over and over again for a little bit, for a lot of patients, will reset those engrams, but sometimes it doesn't. So it's really wiser to know who are those small group of patients with that large AP slide who might be at risk, and then having your patients watch for this. So that really brings us to the conclusion of our time together in our formal presentation. Um, for more information um, in regards to the things on my website, Sarah mentioned that when we open, that's just the web address. Um, and with lots of information, videos um, on using anterior-only appliances and um, leaf gauges and a lot of the things that we talked about today. Um, I want to, just before I turn it back over to Sarah for questions, um, I want to just thank Whitmix again for putting on this, this webinar. I hope the information was really helpful, and I think it's just a great thing that they're making this available and that they'll have this on their website um, for folks to listen to again if you'd like to, or you can have, let other people know about it and have them listen to it. Um, so with that, um, Sarah, if you want to get us started with questions, that would be great. Yeah, we do have a few questions, but um, before we get to those, I just wanted to say that um, Dr. Melker's presentation will be on March 20th, and I will actually send that information out to all attendees with a link to register to that, and it's called Intention-Based Orthotic Therapy, Logical Approach to Treatment Success. So um, with that, we're going to go ahead and get into questions. Um, again, if you have any questions, please write them in the questions box located on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, our first question is, what are your thoughts about hard versus soft appliances? Awesome. So hard versus soft appliances, that's a common question. And I would tell you probably if you look at, again, the diagnostics, I said you need to understand the patient's signs and symptoms and what each appliance does. Um, very small percentage of patients are actually most appropriate in a soft. What a soft appliance does um, a full coverage soft appliance is give you a fully balanced occlusion. So now you are basically um, unloading the joint in not only intercuspal position, but all of the excursive positions. And so for our patients who have joint pain unloading, a uh, full coverage soft can be a great appliance. Um, and of course, they protect the teeth. You're at least putting something between the teeth. Um, soft appliances, the hardest part about them is that um, they don't do anything to decrease muscle activity. And so for a lot of patients, especially clenchers, um, a soft appliance will actually increase their parafunctional activity and then increase the muscle force and the muscle discomfort. Um, so they do have a place, um, but typically for me, it's only patients who have joint pain unloading that I'll make a soft appliance for. Okay, and our next question is, do you vary the vertical on the appliance, or do you rely on the set vertical opening of the discluder? When I'm making uh, an anterior-only appliance and I'm using um, a best bite discluder, for instance, um, often just the standard vertical dimension of the appliance, once it's in and it's relined, will work. I do look at the vertical dimension of occlusion. One of the things that I always make sure of is, number one, that I'm creating the occlusion. And so depending upon the levelness of the person's uh, lower anteriors, you are going to need to do some adjusting. You just use an E-cutter and a straight hand piece to adjust the occlusion on the actual plastic platform of the best bite to make sure that you have even symmetric um, contacts. So if you have one tooth on one side of the midline, you need the same on the other. If you have two teeth, you need two on the other side. And that you've got nice, smooth guidance. So you do want to adjust that. And you do have a couple of millimeters that you can play with the thickness of that plastic platform. So if you do have a person where you want to decrease the vertical dimension opening, you can go ahead and do that by trimming off some of the plastic platform. Um, you know, there's actually some, we get some help by opening the vertical. Altering vertical dimension does minimize muscle force transiently. It usually lasts um, no more than 90 days. Um, so as long as the patient's comfortable, um, I don't fuss with the video that much. Um, and I have some variation where I can do that. Okay, great. Um, our next question is, is there a significant time savings between making a custom interior appliance versus using the best bite? 
um, time savings. Um, you know, using a Best Byte Discluder um, uh, is probably the most efficient way to get an anterior-only appliance. Um, you know, you literally just have, uh, you order them from Whitmix, and so you have them in your office. Um, you get them out, and you can reline them. If I'm going to send the patient home with it, what I will do is I'll roughen the internal surface of the plastic just with an e-cutter. Then I paint it with a um, VPS adhesive, like tray adhesive, and then I reline it. So your time to reline it is whatever the material you're using. Byte registration paste is going to set in 45 seconds. If you're using impression silicone, it could be two to four minutes. Then you do need to trim the excess material and adjust the occlusion. So, you know, from start to finish, you might be looking at maybe a 10-minute procedure to do uh, a best bite. When you're thinking about making a custom appliance, um, now you're really talking about you've got to take an alginate impression. You've got to create a model of, those, of that impression. So even silicone is a couple minutes. Stone has to set. Um, you now need to actually make a biocryl shell, add the composite. So definitely from a time perspective, you're going to invest a lot more time making a custom anterior-only appliance. So the follow-up to that would be, so why would you use one versus the other? Um, I would tell you, um, for most of my patients, if they're going to wear an anterior-only appliance for um, you know, a night or two, a couple of weeks, PRN off and on for a night or two here and there, I'll use a Best Bite. If I do have a patient that's going to wear one for an extended period of time, um, and or every once in a blue moon, it's not often I have a patient that comes in and they feel a lot better, um, but they, they just feel a little awkward with the best bite in their mouth, I might make them an answer only that's custom designed. All right, and, uh, we're going to wrap it up with our final question. Um, what is the typical time frame for treatment or is there a typical schedule normally? Um, typical time frame, that's a great question. Um, you know, if I'm trying to find seated condylar position, I'll make the person their anterior only appliance, instruct them to sleep in it only. We go out two weeks. At the end of the two weeks, their instruction is to wear it the night before their appointment, take it out in the morning only to brush their teeth and eat breakfast, but wear it into the office. And then I'll take it out to take the bite records to find centric relation. Um, if we're doing it because they actually have muscle pain, tension, tightness, tenderness, um, we'll send them home and ask them to sleep in it every night. I typically, at that point, see them back in a week so that we can assess and monitor how they're doing. Um, if they're doing well, we'll typically go out another two or three weeks, see them back again, and then decide moving forward how often or when they would use the appliance. Um, and most of my protocols for using an anterior only maximally are going to go out two to four weeks at the most. Um, if someone at the end of that time period um, still isn't completely better, we need to think about something different. Um, if they are better, then it's really thinking about what's the move forward plan? How often do they need to sleep in their appliance? Can they only use it when they feel some tension or tenderness? Um, one of the great things I love about these appliance designs is you don't have to have the patient in very frequently to do adjustments because it's a very efficient appliance. Um, the muscles relax, you're not going to pick up posterior contact, so there's nothing to adjust out of the way. All right, well, I think that's going to do it for the webinar today. I want to thank everybody for attending and staying with us over for a little bit. Um, and I will see everybody back here at our next webinar on February 28th with Pressing Matters. So thank you and have a great day.